Uh, the next item of business is Scottish, Parliament, Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body Questions. Uh, I'd like to get as many people in as possible, so please succinct questions and answers. Question number one, Mike Rumbles. To ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body what steps it's taking to ensure that officers receive post before the start of parliamentary business. Kessia Dugdale. I thank the member for the question. As members will appreciate, for security reasons, it's important that we screen all mail coming to the Parliament off-site. In 2011, it was agreed that we would no longer pay Royal Mail for the early extraction of the Parliament's mail and we would bring the sorting in-house. This means that screened mail from Royal Mail is now delivered to Holyrood around 9.30, allowing time for our mail team to sort the mail. The first postal delivery is now at 11am. These changes also enabled us to operate one shift instead of two, freeing up a member of staff who was redeployed within the facilities management team. We have no plans to reintroduce an early mail delivery with the significant additional costs that that could involve. Mike Rumbles. <clears throat> now the Parliament's posties do a fabulous job and I don't want anyone to think for a moment that it's my question is a criticism of their work. It, it isn't. But can the corporate body advise, you know, there's been these shift changes the members just mentioned but the first post is now much later than before. Um, and this has happened to, uh, only a recent, recent change. It hasn't happened a long, t a long time ago. So is there no possibility of restoring that earlier post so that we can actually give a good service to our constituents right from the start of the day? Kessia Dugdale. I appreciate the member is a keen bean and he wants to get to work as quickly as possible. Uh, but what, what I would say to him is that the cost of returning to the old system would be around £100,000 of additional revenue every year. So I would ask him to carefully consider if he thinks that additional time is worth £100,000 over the cost of Parliament. This is a saving that we've made. We've managed to redeploy staff within the building. Um, he's desperate to see the newspapers, for example. They're available in Spice from 8 in the morning. He doesn't have to wait until 11 to access them. So the corporate body is pretty confident this is the right and proper thing to do. Question number two, Annie Wells. To ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body whether it will carry out a review of the car park booking system. Kezia Dugdale. Thank the member for the question. The car park policy is aimed at maximising the number of spaces available to members on business days and the car park booking system has been in place since we moved to Holyrood. We have reviewed the booking system several times and have found the current process for booking a parking space to be the fairest and most flexible for allocating the limited number of spaces available. We appreciate that technology is continually evolving and we would be happy to look again at other booking options, including an online booking system. Annie Wells. I thank the, the member for her answer and that's exactly what I was going to come to. An online booking system so that MSPs and parliamentary staff can book or cancel bookings outside normal parliamentary working hours and it would also allow you to see spaces as and when they become available. Would that be something that could be looked into? I would say to the member, we're, we're very keen to look at the option around an online booking system. We, we have looked at it before. The, the software doesn't currently exist for the nature of what we're looking to do, but we'll continually review that. The other thing I would say to members across the chamber um, that a lot of people don't know is that you can book spaces on a half-day basis. People automatically think they might require a full day. So there is more flexibility than you might think, but we'll continue to review this. Excuse me, question number three, Patrick Harvey. Ask the uh, Scottish Parliament corporate body, following the installation of new security devices at pass holder entrances, what action it's taking to address queues forming and delays to entry? Jackson Carlow. Harvey's question is obviously a matter of interest to a number of people. We are obviously all aware that during busy periods, mainly between 8.30 and 9.30 and on business days, queues have been forming, particularly outside the Queensbury House entrance. Now, there are three reasons driving the delays. The Parliament has experienced a software issue resulting in the entry system occasionally resetting, and that's caused a delay. Engineers are on site this week implementing an agreed fix. The other causes are the volume of people arriving during peak times and that some pass holders haven't yet perfected their technique and present their pass and finger, <laughs> present their pass and finger too quickly to the reader, which means that the pass has to be presented again. Now, to address these issues, we will be reminding all pass users that alongside the single entry turnstile at Queensbury House, there are two turnstiles at Canongate, which offer direct access into the garden lobby, as we all know. We have security staff on site to offer support and encouraging anyone having issues accessing the Parliament to schedule a follow-up appointment with the pass studio. We are also discussing with the manufacturer of the turnstiles the possibility of changing the exit turnstile at Queensbury House. There are two 
entrance and one exit, but changing the exit turnstile at Queensbury House into a bi-directional turnstile, allowing it to be used to alleviate queues during peak times. All that fancy language means we are still establishing the technical fixed costs and timescales of that initiative. <laughs> That'll be one of these succinct answers, then. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick Harvey. I'm going to resist the ample opportunity for innuendo here. Um, look, I, I might be prejudiced on this one. I might be biased on it. My, my natural instinct uh, is to feel that the expectation of having my fingerprints taken and having to present biometrics to go into my place of work is something out of a, a, a dystopian nightmare. But this... This is, this is more Brazil than 1984. It doesn't work. It takes ages. I'm all in favor of technology if it's going to make things easier, but this is technology that's making getting in and out of the building worse, more difficult, and more time-consuming. If it doesn't work, can we just rip it out? Jackson Carlo. I, I, I hear Patrick Harvey's uh, difficulties that have been experienced as we facilitate the, the new system. Um, he will know the problem with the old system, which was just a one-factor identification, was that quite inappropriately, many people were pass, handing past back their pass to allow other people into the building who didn't have a pass. And that, obviously, if you think it through, presented serious, uh, serious security risks. The two-factor authentication is designed to make access into the building more secure. Uh, the biometrics are exclusively contained within the card and not held anywhere else, so there is no personal breach of personal data that Mr. Harvey needs to be concerned about. Yes, it may take some time for us to perfect the system for it to work efficiently, but it is there to ensure that all of the public access points into this building are as secure as they have to be to ensure that we can all operate safely within the building at all other times. Question number four, Ruth McGuire. Presiding officer, can I remind the chamber that I convene the cross-party group on credit unions and ask the Scottish parliamentary corporate body what the take-up is of the credit union payroll deduction scheme. Sandra White. Uh, thank you very much, presiding officer. And can I just thank the member for, I think, a very interesting question. At the moment, uh, I can answer for, on behalf of the SPCB, there are currently 35 individuals choosing to make a payroll into their credit union account through the payrolls managed by the SPCB. Of these, 19 are SPCB staff, 10 are MSP staff, and 6 are MSPs. And this is out of a total of 1,399 people who are served by our own payroll service. Ruth McGuire. I appreciate that answer. The role of credit unions in reducing poverty and the impact of financial worries is well recognised. Um, everyone will know that the membership is based on a common bond. It seems a wasted opportunity to not offer staff and members the benefit of wage deduction directly to one of their local credit unions. I would, for example, love to be able to offer my own staff or indeed anyone from Ayrshire the opportunity to have deductions made to First Alliance Credit Union. Would uh, Sandra White MSP meet with me and see how we could possibly make this happen for everyone? Sandra White. I, I agree entirely with uh, the member. It is a very important issue, uh, credit unions and having access to it. Uh, the member will be aware that the SPCB do advertise the credit union, which we facilitate at the moment. But I think what she has raised today uh, is an excellent idea. Uh, I can't give an answer today, obviously, on my own behalf. But uh, if the member is, is content, I'll take it forward to the next SPCB meeting and discuss it there. And I'm more than happy to meet with the member and discuss it also. Question number five, Christine Graham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Parliament corporate body how it will mark the contribution to the Parliament of staff past and present who were here in 1999. Liam MacArthur. Can I thank Christine Graham for a question? In our 20th anniversary year, the corporate body wishes to express our thanks to those staff past and present who helped establish the Parliament in 1999. Uh, Christine Graham may be interested to know that there are around 80 members of the current Parliamentary Service staff group who joined before the first election in May 1999 and a total of around 120 who started at some point during that year. The corporate body values the contribution made by all staff and contractors in the parliament from all parts of the organisation regardless as to how long they have worked here. Throughout 2019, uh, in the in-house newsletter staff will be reflecting on their time at the Parliament. And this is an opportunity for those who joined in 1999 to share their memories from that year and their reflections on the, how the Parliament has evolved over the last two decades. Christine Graham. 
Um, I thank the member for his response. I associate myself with his remarks congratulating the staff past and present. Uh, here is my B plan. Um, can I ask, if we are to have a modest 20th birthday bash, that if we're going to ask former MSPs, can we also ask former members of staff to attend, as this parliament very much operates as a team? Liam MacArthur. Can I reciprocate by echoing the sentiments expressed by uh, Ms Graham, as uh, she will know that our intention is for the parliament to celebrate its 20th anniversary at an event on the 29th of June. All members of staff, past and present, will be encouraged to attend that event when further announcements uh, are to be made later in the spring. And I understand that the Chief Executive, Sir Paul Greith, will be writing out to um, current staff and um, past staff to that effect. Question number six, John Mason. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Parliament corporate body whether it is possible to vary contracts of employment for MSP staff in order to give flexibility to suit local circumstances. Andy Whiteman. I thank Mr Mason for that uh, question. The SPCB, of course, recognises, as I'm sure the member does, that members are the employers of their own staff. To help members fulfil the role as employers, the corporate body has provided a minimum set uh, of terms and conditions on which member staff should be employed. And provided members ensure that their staff are employed on terms and conditions that are no less favourable uh, than the minimum set by the corporate body. They're free to vary those terms as they see fit, as long, of course, as they do so within uh, the capped staff cost uh, provision. John Mason. I thank uh, the member for that answer. However, uh, without getting into all the details, I'm currently trying to get a contract adjusted for a new member of staff. I've asked for five changes uh, in the standard contract. Uh, human resources are resisting on two of them. It seems to me that as we go through year by year, there is less and less flexibility. There is more and more rigidity. And I would just like uh, an assurance from the corporate body that they will maximise the amount of uh, flexibility that staff and MSPs have. Andy Whiteman. Well, uh, I thank uh, Mr Mason for those uh, further remarks. Uh, as I indicated earlier, it is for members to determine um, the terms and conditions in which their, their, their staff are employed, provided that they are no less advantageous than the minimum set by the corporate body. Now, obviously, uh, we're not in a position to uh, discuss particular details of Mr. Mason's uh, uh, member of staff. Um, I mean, if he wishes to raise it uh, with any of us, I'd be happy to, to, to meet, um, uh, to discuss what particular issues uh, he's having, uh, to find out whether, in fact, those are issues pertaining to the, uh, uh, the, the um, standard terms and conditions in which mm -hmm. member staff are expected to be uh, employed. I'm not, I'm not aware that the conditions have uh, become tighter over the last few years, but again, if Mr Mason wants to present evidence to that regard, we can have a look again at that question and make sure that members have the flexibility that I think you know, we all expect to be able to employ uh, staff on terms and conditions which, they, uh, f f which meet their circumstances. Question number seven, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body whether it will provide an update on the ongoing issues with the car park barrier system. Kezia Dugdale. The car park barrier system was installed in 2007. In January this year, we did experience a series of component failures which led to the car park barrier system being out of service for 10 days. Following these component failures, a comprehensive root cause analysis of the equipment and the controls was carried out by the manufacturers and measures have been put in place to prevent a similar incident happening again. Alexander Stewart. Thank you for that response. When the barrier is at fault, uh, we find that the staff have to be outside and deployed in all weathers. And surely this poses a greater risk to the building because the barrier is down. Uh, can I ask what further measures can be put in place to ensure that the risks to the staff in the building are not secure? Can I say to the member there is no increased security risk when the barrier is out of service because we have the roller shutters before you go down into the car park entrance. I do share his concerns though about asking security staff to be out in the cold elements and that's why we try to avoid them having to do that as regularly as possible. The, the barrier system isn't out of service as often as he might think it is. There are three scheduled periods in any given year for scheduled maintenance and beyond that there was seven incidences across the whole of 2018 when it was out of order that many of the issues behind that have been resolved now and we look forward to a more positive future in that regard. Question number eight, Tom Arthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body how it supports staff who are carers. Kezia Dugdale. The Scottish Parliament Corporate Body recognises that many staff face significant caring responsibilities and is committed to helping them balance their home and work life. We appreciate the demands this may place on staff and at times it may be difficult for them to combine their work and caring responsibilities. 
As an employer, we are committed to providing an inclusive working environment where carers feel valued and supported. To help us meet this commitment, we have put in place a range of support options for carers, including access to carer-friendly policies and working practices, which offer staff the flexibility and support to manage their time when care at home is needed. Tom Arthur. I thank the member for that answer. Um, the member will be aware of the Carer Positive Initiative, uh, which recognises employers who promote carer-friendly policies within the workplace. The Scottish Parliament, of course, is a carer-positive employer. However, it's currently the entry level which is engaged. Can the Kezia Dugdale outline how the SPCB sees um, the Scottish Parliament moving and progressing to become an established and eventually an exemplary carer-positive employer? Kezia Dugdale. I thank the member for that follow-up. We are indeed a carer-positive employer and the SPCB continues to demonstrate its commitment to staff with caring responsibilities and more widely to support staff to lead independent, healthy and active lives. Can I reassure Tom Arthur that we are committed to achieving the highest level in the award scheme in becoming an exemplary carer-positive employer by 2020? So this means uh, providing exemplary support to carers by enhancing our workplace policies. Our carer staff network, which is led by carers within the building, will have a key role in helping us achieve this highest possible standard. That concludes SPCB questions and we'll move on to the next item of business. Can I remind all members at this point that this question slot is considered the same as portfolio questions and should anyone come into the chamber to ask a question or attempt to ask a question, they should stay for the full session. Thank you.